first reason you can't play jazz is because you're thinking too much about scales. So there's this whole notion of chord scales in traditional jazz pedagogy, right? And I think this is why so many people misunderstand the art of playing chord changes. The moment you think about a scale representing a chord, you've given yourself too many options, right? Because four of the seven notes in the scale do not help you to articulate the chord. So that's problematic on too many levels to even unpack right now, but the solution is really simple. Instead of thinking about a scale to represent a chord, think about a triad to represent a chord. Every note in the triad equally articulates the chord that's being played at the moment, right? So if you only play triads and you get comfortable with all the combinations of triads, well, you're gonna sound really effective right away and you're gonna let the chord changes speak for themselves finally, right? You're not muddying the message with all these scales and extra notes that don't really help anything. Now this becomes very clear when I put sequences of chords together, right? So let's take the first four bars of Countdown by Coltrane with just triads, right? Watch how it just speaks for itself so beautifully. <laughs> Right? letting the spirit of creation move directly through you once again. So that triadic framework is just allowing you to let the song do all the work, right? It simplifies so many things. For example, you no longer have to think about playing strong chord tones on strong beats. You should just always play strong chord tones. What are strong chord tones? Triads. And this takes us right into the second reason why you can't really play jazz. It's because you're not thinking about rhythm properly. And this is because when people think about jazz rhythm, they think about bebop scales and chromatic passing tones and approach tones and all this nonsense, right? That's all a distraction to divert your focus from your greatest asset as an improviser, which is syncopation. <laughs> Now syncopation instantly makes so much sense in the context of triads, and I'll show you what I mean. First four bars of Countdown, in time, thinking about triadic syncopation. Right? There's not even room to play other notes. I only just played triads, and that was more than sufficient. I could have used more space. I could have used more syncopation. You can never have enough syncopation. Because one thing you gotta realize with jazz is, you know, you're playing with people usually, right? Most of the time, unless you're practicing. And how do you sound good with people? Syncopation, man. That's what a drummer grabs onto. That's what a bass player grabs onto. Syncopation is the way you stir the pot. You, you make the music more interesting when you syncopate it. See, now if I had played notes outside of the triad and was playing syncopated, well then guess what? I've completely lost everybody. Nobody knows what I'm doing anymore. That's not the right strategy, right? The right combination is syncopation and triads. And this is the trap that most people fall into when they start learning jazz, right? They think they gotta fill all this space, right? So they're hung up on the chord scale idea because they're like, oh, perfect, I've got seven notes. Now I'll definitely fill up all the space. So that's problematic because you don't want to fill up the space, right? You want to use space. Like I said, that stirs the pot, space, syncopation. That's all the same thing, stir the pot. That's what's interesting, right? That's what gets people's ears perking up. Not just continuous streams of notes, obviously. We all know this. So if you think about the two focus points of improvisation, it's really just triads and syncopation. You put those things together, you're golden. You really don't need much else. And this brings us to the third reason you can't play jazz. You don't have a system for internalizing form. So form is the most important thing in jazz. It's also the most challenging thing in jazz. But you do understand form. I'm pretty sure all of you watching this video know about the 12 bar blues form and intuitively understand it. Meaning that you can hear the harmony moving through the form and you see that form as a unified whole, right? 12 bars, where it begins, where it ends, how it repeats, you understand all these things, right? So in jazz, we have more complex forms, right? So when you first start learning jazz, the hardest thing to do is internalize those more 
complex forms, right? Because with the blues, you internalize it almost by osmosis, right? Just from like jam sessions and the radio and Stevie Ray Vaughan and Jimi Hendrix. Like you literally just heard it so many times since you've been born that when you picked up the guitar, you're like, wow, this makes complete sense, right? So that is perfect, right? That's the framework for understanding everything I'm talking about. The blues is the jumping off point 100% for sure. I believe that. But just understand the most important aspect of the blues is that you hear how those chords move through it and you're able to articulate those. So it's the exact same principle in every jazz song, right? It's just about articulating the chord changes, internalizing those forms so you can articulate the chord changes, right? So here's the thing. How do you internalize form? I have the dumbest but most effective exercise of all time for this, right? You've already seen it, you already know it. It's literally just doing things like this. I'm just gonna play a triad and I'm gonna make sure that triad covers whatever length of time the chord change lasts for, how many beats the chord change lasts for. So in Countdown, the chord changes mostly last for two beats and the last one in the sequence lasts for four beats, right? So then I think, okay, what is two beats? One and two. That's what I'm gonna use. That's my anchor point for two beats, right? So I do that for every chord with two beats. And then when I get to the last chord in the sequence, it's four beats, I just wait. So like this. That's the exercise, right? That's how you internalize the form. You just do that with every set of chord changes and what you're doing is you're getting your ears to recognize those harmonic movements. Now that's a simple exercise, but it's an absolute game changer, right? And you can see how it quickly morphs into actual improvisation, right? If I just mix it up a little bit, I'm gonna get huge bang for my buck, like this. <laughs> It's like almost exactly the same, but I'm just using syncopation and I'm playing the triadic notes out of order, right? There's only three of them, right? Try to figure out a system of playing, you know, seven notes out of order and juggling them up with any kind of like recognizable pattern, right? It's obviously possible and like that's like Holdsworth levels and stuff, but just start with the triads and then you'll get to that Holdsworth level, which is really about triad pairs. Okay, we'll get there later. Don't get ahead of yourself, but I'll just, I'll plant that seed though. Think about it. Triad pairs, two triads, it's six notes, right? That's almost seven notes, but they're both triads. Maximum power tools squared, right? We'll get to that later. I'm foreshadowing. We don't need to get into that right now. So to recap, the three reasons, right? <laughs> You didn't understand that scales are not very good. Now you do understand that triads are the keys, right? Those are the only notes you need to worry about. Later, you can start to add scale degrees, but you'll understand where and when to add them effectively because you'll realize that the triads, like I said, get you 80% of the way there. And so you wanna be very, very deliberate and careful about where you put those other notes. Even the sevenths, man. The sevenths are not that good to be blunt. They don't sound great. They actually are like the worst choice by far, right? One of the patterns that's good, classic Coltrane, right? That's one, two, three, five. So it's, they call those tetra chords, right? So the two of the key with the three and the five of the key, the triad, that's a pretty good combination. But other than that, you really wanna be careful. And even that, I feel like I just, I shouldn't have distracted you with that. Only focus on the triads. I'm telling you, man, that's where you see those crazy fast results. Number two was you weren't thinking about rhythm properly. Now you're thinking about rhythm properly. It's about syncopation. It's not about bebop scales and landing on the right chord tone on the, on the downbeat. No, it's about syncopation, right? You should stir the pot as much as you can with syncopation. It's almost like playing strong chord tones on strong beats is like not even smart, right? That's like actually not cool because syncopation with strong chord tones, like right after the beat or right before that beat, that is sick, right? Clearly, right? You don't wanna play a strong tone on a strong beat. That's actually, now that I'm thinking about it, that's like the one thing I would never do. <laughs> Oh man, that's it. That's a hot take for sure. But but it makes complete logical sense, right? Think about like Meshuggah Basics 101. Think about syncopated music 101. And the third reason you couldn't play jazz is because you didn't have a system for downloading those forms into your consciousness, right? It took you like 20 years of osmosis to get the blues form in your subconscious. You want to get giant steps in your subconscious in about two hours. You know how to do it. <laughs> sounds ridiculous and sounds boring, but the fact that it sounds ridiculous and boring is what automatically turns that into 
literally just because you're like, I'm just gonna mess with that, right? This video is brought to you by Systems for Creation. Dude, check it out in the link, right? This is the stuff we're getting into. This is the foundation of what we're getting into in that school. You need to understand triads and triadic interchange, right? That's kind of the foundation of our compositional principle, right? So jazz provides the perfect framework to sort of mess with all the different combinations of triads and rhythm, right? And in jazz, we're mainly improvising, but in composition, it's like we're slowing down time and doing improvisation with a little bit more time to think about it. And by doing that, now we're able to come up with really clever solutions for melodic rhythms, right? So you see how composition and improvisation are obviously connected. It's just a time differential. And you obviously clearly understand now that the foundation of beautiful music is triads. So you see the fundamental connection of jazz to composition, right? And you know what kind of compositions we're talking about. We're, we have like Meshuggah beat cycles going through this kind of harmonic approach, right? <laughs> Obviously, all inevitable stuff. So if you want to get into the school, link in the description, right? If you want to work with me one-on-one -on -one while you can, you can message me on Instagram and we can talk about potentially doing that. Otherwise, Coltrane with Sugar Forever, dude. Never forget Countdown, dude. The Carnival of Cycles, dude.